Welcome, action fans, and thanks for joining us for another edition of All 90s Action All The Time, as we do another one of our season-ending bonus episodes. I'm your host, Scott Murphy, and this time we're looking at 1996's Mission Impossible. Now, as previously explained on on other uh, season-ending bonus episodes, uh, we picked the bonus episode based on it being connected to the main season in some way, uh, but uh, led by an action star we won't be doing a whole season on. Unlike the two previous, uh, actually three previous editions uh, we, we did, where I connected it with a director or a co-star, initially I chose this one purely on thematic terms, as both The Saint uh, from our Val Kilmer season and Mission Impossible are disguise-heavy spy movies based on 1960s TV shows. Plus, um, obviously, you know, Tom Cruise and Val Kilmer starred together in, in Top Gun, but that was the 80s, not the 90s, so not a direct connection. However, deep diving into this film's cast, I did find a connection among, amongst cast members, as it turns out that British actor and comedian David Schneider cameos both in this film and The Saint. Anyway, now that that's all explained, let me introduce my co-host. Uh, first up, we have my regular partner in crime. You know who he is. He's one third of the Bloodhound Picks podcast. He's a screenwriter. And he's always on the edge of being disavowed from this podcast. Mr. Craig Draheim. One, two, three. Toast. Toast. <laughs> 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 and as well as Craig, we also have friend of the show making his third appearance. Uh, it's writer, director, Mr. Adam Stovall. Or at least we think it's Mr. Adam Stovall. <laughs> Maybe later in the episode, it will be revealed that he was actually John Voight in disguise this whole time. You've never seen me very upset. <laughs> <laughs> and I am not John Voight. Yeah. He's, he's not, <laughs> not John, not John Voight. If later on in an episode he starts giving controversial opinions on various <laughs> political things, we'll know that he is actually John Voight. I, I actually have a John Voight story for you one of these days <laughs> about that specific thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you, can, you can tell us all about that uh, straight after I give the, the background details on the film as, as I normally do in each episode. Uh, so, so two hours from now, great. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a little, the little bit of the rest of the intro where I, where I just round up the credits and um, you know all that stuff that the, you know it's critical ratings all right. and all the, the the normal stuff that I do. Uh, so I'll quickly do that and then we can get straight to your story. Uh, so <laughs> Mission Impossible was released on May the twenty second, nineteen ninety six. It was directed by Brian De Palma, who you may know from such films as Scarface, The Untouchables, Carrie, a bunch of other things. Um, the writing credits are a bit more of a complicated situation. Uh, so the story credit went to uh, David Kep, um, who wrote Jurassic Park, uh, amongst many other things, and Stephen Zalian, who wrote Schindler's List, among, amongst many other things. While the screenplay credit went to Kep, and Robert Town, who is most famous for writing Chinatown. Although there was an original script uh, from uh, husband and wife writing team Willard Huck and Gloria Katz, but that was discarded. Um, mm. And uh, I should have mentioned that they wrote the likes of American Graffiti and Temple of Doom and uh, Heard the Duck. Um, <laughs> you know but, why uh, they brought in Robert Town? Um Yes, I know, like, um, so the Willard Huck and, and Gloria Katz's script was um, thrown out. Uh, David Kemp yes. was then brought onto the project um, for a million dollars, apparently, and he rewrote, uh, and then apparently Robert Town uh, was brought on by Tom Cruise uh, well, himself. Because Kemp uh, had to go direct the trigger effect. Yes. And they needed a writer during production. But then Kemp oh. was rehired and there was uh, various times where they were in Prague in different hotel rooms, writing different scenes. And it's, um, yeah, there was... <laughs> a wonderfully uh, efficient process. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Well, apparently there was a time, um, like you know, we'll talk about it in the middle of the movie, the, the kind of the kind of betrayal scene where we where we it's revealed that um, somebody has betrayed somebody else, um, uh, we'll, which we'll discuss. Well, we'll be mysterious Spoilers. about it now, but we'll discuss it further. But apparently, um, at that point, uh, Robert Town was writing in between takes, doing rewrites in between oh, wow. takes. So, uh, very yeah. efficient production, yes. <laughs> Um, so critically, it's currently sitting at a 7.1 out of 10 on IMDb, 66% on Rotten Tomatoes based on 61 reviews, uh, 59 out of 100 on Metacritic, uh, based on 29 reviews, and it has a 3.5 on Letterbox. Box office wise, it made a staggering 40, uh, no, 457.7 million dollars off of an $80 million budget, making it the third biggest movie of 1996, uh, which was uh, pretty lucky all round, as Paramount originally wanted to make it for between $40 and $50 million. But anyway, that's all the background information now given. So you can give us your John Voight story now, Adam. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So the very first TCM Fest, uh, Turner Turner Classic Movies, has done a film festival for years. The very first one I covered because I was still with Creative Screenwriting Magazine, and we were they were doing all these great Q and A's. Like they showed the seventy millimeter roadshow print of two thousand one and had Douglas Trumbull. They showed The Graduate and had Buck Henry. They showed Good, Bad, and the Ugly and had Eli Wallach. Um, well, they showed uh, Midnight Cowboy and had John Voight. And I would go to these screenings and then plug into the sound system to record the Q and A and we would then uh, release it as part of the creative screenwriting podcast. Um, and I had just a few months prior been to a midnight cowboy event that was Dustin Hoffman talking and it was great. It was insightful and funny and it was awesome. Um, and then this is of course, John Voigt talking about midnight cowboy. So I'm expecting something similar plug in, he gets up there and he's just, and uh, the person, and I think it was Peter Biskind who was doing the Q&A, and mm-hmm. um, before Peter Biskind can even, like, get into a question, John Voigt says, you know, my friend, I don't know, maybe Peter had asked a question, but John Voigt, nary a fuck given, he said, uh, you know, my friend Rich Little is here, and uh, he'd like to tell you wh- what it would sound like if so-and-so played rats, you know, uh, and like Rich Little comes up and just starts doing all these impressions of like Ronald Reagan saying, you know, screaming, I'm walking here and stuff. And it was just bizarre. <laughs> and then they segued from that into a total pre-MAGA right-wing political rally. And I've never seen, it was like, it's in the Egyptian theater. Right. And like, you never think that the Egyptian theater will host a right wing political mm-hmm. rally, but like it got to a point where I was kind of like, I think I may need to leave. <laughs> like this seems like it might get dangerous. Um, yeah, he he is insane and does not care at all what anyone else thinks or wants. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> I really don't think Peter ever, ever asked the second question. <laughs> wow. <laughs> But he, um, his career is interesting for that fact. Same with what, like Charlton Heston, where you look at him when he was young. He did, you know, I mean, Midnight Cowboy, uh, Deliverance. It's like all of these that he worked with. You know, with Hal Ashby. Yeah. Like, how, you know, oh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Anywho, that's a John Boyd story. <laughs> uh, oh, Peter. Yeah. Peter Biscuit asked the question, when you're making Midnight Cowboy, do you know you're making something great? And which is a total softball and not a real question anyway. But yeah, John Boyd was just like, anyway, Rich Little. <laughs> it, was, it was very bizarre. That's insane. <laughs> that is really insane. So much like Mission Impossible, he turned on Peter Biskind. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. You, you are. You are indeed. You are indeed. So b- before we we get into the movie uh, fully, um, like uh, if you want to go first, Adam, tell us your know, your relationship to this movie when you first saw it. You know how many times you've seen it. Whatever. I love this movie. Um, it's probably my favorite franchise of films. Um, 
And I saw this opening weekend, probably opening night, 1996. I was a senior in high school, uh, or it was my senior year. It may have, I think it was, a, it was a summer release. So it would have been just before school started. But, um, I remember getting my hair cut shorter because I liked, like, I, I loved it so much that I was like, I want that haircut. Like, <laughs> Uh, I had I, I bought the soundtrack, which yeah. had the like the U two version of the theme song. Uh, I don't remember how many times I saw it in the theater. Um, I you know, I was just telling Craig I saw Mission Impossible Fallout like at least four times yeah. in the theater, and I've seen it at least ten times total now. Um, but I hadn't watched, even though I loved this, I hadn't watched the original in actually quite a few years. Um, so this was a really great excuse to go back and like, I just love it. I, I, it's, it's like a, it's like a well-worn coat. You just slide mm. in and you feel comfortable. I love the pacing of it. I love the weird de ness of it. Like I just adore it. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And Craig, what about you? Yeah. Um, so I, I watched this when it was on, you know, it would have just came out on VHS and I remember the first time I watched it, the only thing that I ever took from it, I know I said this off air, was that um, I didn't even remember. I mean, I knew there was the dangling big set piece that is so famous, but the main thing I remembered was the Eli, uh, Emilio Estevez death. And that was because I, uh, a big hockey fan, I... Grew up in I grew up in hockey country, and I love the Mighty Ducks, which is how they link. And I haven't watched those in years, but anyways. And then my I watched, and I didn't really think about it for a while. I saw the second one a few times, and then when the third one came along, I went back and rewatched it. And no, I ended up loving it. And I actually I would agree with Adam. This has kind of become one of my favorite franchises even though i've probably only seen all the other ones except one and two one time maybe yeah i think one time a piece but i don't know i just love overly kind of complicated plots and um, yeah kind of what they do with it is is just fun for me and so yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay it also has that weird thing where it has an overly complicated plot but it also doesn't care about yeah. its own plot yeah and it's oh no it. no it doesn't yeah. And it's still accessible and like being almost like a, you know, a comfortable popcorn flick. Like it's not. Oh, yeah. 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 Because like a lot of spy flicks, you know, it's like all the plots are a game of follow the MacGuffin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So like uh, I, I really, you know, I, I, I I loved this film as a kid. Um, I don't think I didn't see it in cinemas. I definitely bought it on video and I, I watched it a lot on video. And um, yeah, I've, I've always I've always really liked this film. And you know, when we were, like started doing the, like this podcast, because um, I love making lists. Um, I like <laughs> on on my letterbox, I, I drew up a, like a kind of top fifty uh, '90s action movies, um, which I've still not made public yet because I'm like I, I'm continually tinkering with it, so it still says private. Um, but uh, I'll I'll release it to the world at, at some stage. Um, but. Uh, uh, or, or maybe, but even by the time this episode uh, airs, because it's not going to air for like months after this recording. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. So this is only the second time we've we've covered um, a movie uh, that is in my is in my top twenty, uh, oh. and you know, so so yeah, I definitely rate it highly. I have an odd relationship with the franchise, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's like, it, I never class it as like one of my top franchises, but like, I always, I always enjoy them. Like, I'm always like, yeah. oh, that was good. I enjoyed that. Like, but like, I, I, I never, I never like, I don't have like a deep well of love like I do for other fights. Like, for example, I do not love the Mission Impossible franchise as much as I love the Bond franchise. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, right. Like I, and I have very little, uh, I, I don't really care for the Bond franchise yeah. overall, but, uh, I, I, to that, like I have friends who I feel like every time they see it, a, like a see a Mission Impossible movie, there's like, well, that didn't need to be that good. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I heard that. I remember, like, after Fallout, I heard that from so many people. Like, this movie could have been like this did not, that. Did not need to be that good. Like, yeah, that's what they do. 
<laughs> they have an insane amount of money and they just travel the world and come up with shit. Yeah. Um, and you have Chris McQuarrie who loves solving narrative problems and puzzles. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's fair. I think, you know, it's kind of a franchise that doesn't really need or as, as, as much as Tom Cruise registers as like a thirsty person, mm-hmm. um, it's not really a thirsty franchise. No. Like it's kind of there to be taken for granted. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. For, for, for sure. And like, like I say, like, uh, Fallout, um, like we will get into the, the plot of this movie. We always, uh, I, I said <laughs> that, you know, before the recording, we won't really get into the franchise much, but we got it. Um, so <laughs> like, um, since, since we're here, we're already in this ballpark. So we we're, we're going to run with this. Um, so Fallout kind of reignited my interest in, in the Mission Impossible films. I have to say, because, um, for me, I love the first one. I think the second one is a great guilty pleasure watch, but in a bad movie. Um, <laughs> and, and then the third one, I just kind of found kind of, eh, I was like, and then I was kind of, and then I was kind of felt kind of over the franchise. I was like, I was like, I'm, I'm kind of over it. So, and then I didn't watch four or five. And then for, for, I don't know, just because everybody hyped it so much, I was like, Oh, oh, I suppose I'll watch Fallout, I guess. Um, and then, but then I loved it. And then, uh, and then I was like, oh shit, now I've got to go back and cause I'm a completist, like, you know, so I, I'm like, oh God, I got to go back and watch four and five now. So, so I did that and I, I, I enjoyed them. Uh, I, I thought, you know, I enjoyed five more than four, but like, um, well, I enjoyed them both. And, and the, yeah, they're all kind of, you know, like they're just, they're just solidly, they're just solidly made. I, I just, I suppose, like, as much as I admire these films for their action set pieces, like, um, I think I quite, I think, like, I'm drawn most to, like, cor- colorful characters. Right. And, like, mm. I suppose, like, um, it, so in some ways I am drawn more to other spy franchises. Like, the, 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 I've not seen the last Bourne movie, which apparently isn't that good. And Bourne Legacy is, like, you don't need to watch that. But, like, the Bourne trilogy, like I like I find yeah. them like I find that they've got more uh, complex and and interesting characters, and Bond has more colorful characters, yeah. and like well, I think like I like uh, that's what makes those movies memorable to me. Whereas like in my head, like the Mission Impossible movies get like all jumbled uh, because it's just like it's just a bunch of action set pieces in my head. Of like, you know, like if I was to think about Ghost Protocol right now, I'm like, um, do I remember any <laughs> of the characters? No. Uh, what do I remember? Uh, he climbs the Burj Khalifa. He outruns a sandstorm. Do you remember anything else? Uh, not much. Uh, no. <laughs> what, what I'll say though is what I appreciate, I guess, opposed to, you know, Bor- Born and Bond is that and I know we talked about this off air a little bit, is that Mission Possible, I like the fact that it's going in the, not a complete ensemble route. It's still definitely Tom Cruise's movie, but mm. like it is becoming more and more this group dynamic. I think that's when it works well. And I know we're going to talk about when we get into the movie of wanting, because you and I both agreed on it, Scott, of we wish there was more showing of that team in the beginning because, yeah, I don't know. Well, you know, like, uh, before we get too far past it, like, speaking of, you know, when Scott talking about the Bourne movies, like, especially the Bourne identity, like, it felt revolutionary when you watched it opening weekend. Like, it is, it is kind of wise, you know, a lot of us love watching no budget, low budget horror and, and sci-fi and whatnot is because, like, because they don't have the money for all the great effects, you get a lot of really cool ideas. And yeah. it felt like, you know, and, and Doug Lyman obviously cut his teeth in the, in the low to no budget world, but like, it felt like them really engaging with the genre and with like, what is an action story and what does an action hero have to be, you know? And I, I still remember the moment when he like pulls the map off the wall so that he knows where to go to get out. And it's just like, I've, I don't think I've ever seen that in a movie before. Like, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and you know, with with the rest of the franchise, like especially 
the last few years of like making like as a, as a filmmaker myself, like, and learning so much about the process, I love listening to Chris McQuarrie talk about how they make Mission Impossible movies because uh, it, <laughs> it's very validating to be like, they have $180 million and they don't have a script. Like they're, they're coming, they're figuring it out as they go. And, you know, and he said, you know, he has said, he was just like, at this point, like, we just go out into the world and we're like, all right, what's interesting? Like what, okay, that's a cool spot. We can do, we can do a sequence there and use the location in this way, you know, whether it's the opera house or a, a motorcycle chase through, you know, Paris. Um, and, and with, yeah, it's just, I, I love, I, you know, and I think it was Rogue Nation when they decided like, let's make this about the team. Like, let's mm. really make this about what it is to make a movie and, you know, how it kind of comes together through chance and you plan, but you never know if it's going to go that way. Um, and I think that's probably why, like, now Benji is such a huge part of it. Luther, obviously, has been there since the beginning. Uh, now we have Issa, Issa Faust. Like, you have these very strong, like, you know, even if they're not vibrant in a way that like leaps, you know, that makes you think of them amongst the greatest characters in all cinema, they mm -hmm. have very defined roles and you know what everyone brings to the table. And if, you know, if you were to make a Mission Impossible movie without Benji, you would miss Benji, not just because he's Simon Pegg, but because he genuinely brings something to the team dynamic. Um, they better never make one without Elsa Faust or I will riot <laughs> in the streets. But yeah, like... I don't know. I, I really, I said it before. I love these movies and yeah. uh, it's only intensified as I get to know more and more about filmmaking. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so. well, I, I suppose I was going to say it's a mighty defense of the franchise, but like I wasn't really uh, tearing the franchise there. You know? I think uh, <laughs> we're all on the same page that we're fans. We're just different levels of fans. Right. I, suppose. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It really is that thing of like, I love this movie. I think it's all right. Pistols at dawn, sir. <laughs> How can you not love something that I? <laughs> I, I, I know, I know, I know, and I do. I like you know because this is one of my kind of childhood action movies. So I, I do, I do love this movie. Like I just said, I like I just have like a more, um, like but again, I don't really dislike any of the movies. Just uh, some of them. I, yeah. I just like um I suppose they're very they just uh, don't leap out at me in in the same in the same way as as, uh, as some, some other franchises as a, as a franchise right. overall but I love this movie I love Fallout I'd be very interested to see what what they do uh, with with uh, 7 and 8 uh, but yeah. we've got to get into we've yeah. got to get into this film so <laughs> I'll, I'll kick off the I'll kick off the plot of this film and, and then um we'll 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 throw it out um so this film opens Kiev, Estevez as um, <laughs> Jack. Uh, I can't remember his surname now. Um, his, his, his character is he's called Jack. Jack Harmon, I think. Yes. Um, he is watching a screen. Uh, somebody is being interrogated. It's clearly uh, Tom Cruise in a mask. Uh, but um, not the person being interrogated, uh, the, the, the interrogator. And um, yeah, and he's interrogating a guy. They're trying to get a name. Uh, Tom Cruise manages to, uh, Ethan Hunt manages to get said name from this guy. It's kind of, it, it's like, a, it's an interesting little scene. Like, I definitely, there's like a moment in the scene I thought was quite funny because, like, when he takes a drink with the guy, like, he throws the drink out, but he does it, like, right in front of his face. And I was like, surely, I know, like, the guy, like, is, it's like his drink is, like, poisoned and he dies almost immediately after that. But I just feel like, I'm like, surely we'd have noticed that being thrown out in front of his face like that. He was in the middle of drinking, though. Yeah. He does it when the guy's head's tilted back and his eyes are closed because he's drinking. <laughs> Fair enough. Yep. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll go with it. I'll go with it. it, just, it just, <laughs> There's so many ridiculous things in this movie that, like, that's that at least has a, a has somewhat of an explanation. <laughs> no, I, no, I, I know, I know, I know, I know. I am yes. There is a bunch of ridiculous things. We will we will talk um, about yeah. my favorite ridiculous thing in the Mission Impossible movies, and it's none of the physics defying stuff, none of the big <laughs> stunt stuff. But the one thing that amuses me most about the, the, the um, uh, uh, Mission Impossible franchise, we will talk about probably later. We'll talk about it later, towards the end. Um, anyway, we get our first mask pool, so that's cool. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, and it's basically uh, the place they were interrogating, this hotel room that they were interrogating him in. It's revealed to be a set, and that, that's, that's quite a fun uh, moment. And um, uh, we know that uh, Emmanuel Bert is is in the film as well uh, because she's pretending to be dead and is is w- woken up uh, by Ethan Hunt. Um, who looks really concerned as if she, like, her acting is so convincing that it's like she actually is dead, but like, no, she's fine. Um, and I want to point out that in my plot notes that I wrote for this film, every time uh, the theme tune uh, comes on, I've written in all block caps that theme tune because it <laughs> deserves that, because that Lilo Schifrin theme is. Uh, it's one of the most amazing things about this franchise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. I I just saw somebody on on Twitter the other day say like the skip intro button has killed TV theme songs. And it's like eh, we'd already been kind of losing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, you don't get Lalo Schifrin. You know, nobody's nobody's hiring Alvin Silvestri to write the theme song for their show in 2021, which is sad. Uh, yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. Um. And then, like, yeah, no, that, that is, I, I, I do feel like, yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've had the best, uh, TV theme tunes, like all the, all the, all the kind of favorite, all my favorite TV theme tunes are for, like from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, really. <laughs> I think about it sometimes because, like, I th- uh, like Golden Globes or Emmy, you know, they'll, they'll play the music while the person's walking up, and you know. I remember when Lost was airing, like the theme song for Lost is "Bong," <laughs> <laughs> and just I remember like, like, is that what they're gonna play when? And they don't; they play something else. But it's just I don't know. I, I mean, obviously, music matters a lot to me, and I, I think about yeah. themes a lot. But yeah, I do miss when you know you had the great like Cheers, you know, and and you had just really great uh, Mash, you know, the yeah. great theme tunes to these yeah. songs these shows and i think like I, in terms of instrumental like i was i was gonna say oh there's been some great theme tunes of more more recent shows but all the shows i'm thinking of are like 15 to 20 the, years old um but um, you know, like, i mean but in, terms just, too, like, in terms of like yeah. songs not not theme tunes not yeah. like instrumental theme tunes but in terms of like songs that were made that, that were you know, made the theme tune of the show like you know like the likes of like the sopranos Sons of Anarchy, Boardwalk Empire, they all have good theme tunes. Um, like opening songs and playing the start of the episode. Yeah. Yeah. Will we ever get another It's Gary it's it's Gary Shandling's theme? <laughs> <laughs> I love that one so much. Uh, uh, what happens next? Yeah. <laughs> what happens next? What happens next is like during the opening credits we get a highlight package of the film. <laughs> um and uh, which is kind of weird. Because uh, as much as I, I should have said at the top of the show, plot spoilers, because we talk about the whole plot from beginning to end. That's the, the whole point of the show. If you've not listened before, <laughs> I should have said, you know, and if you've not seen it, we're going to talk about it also. We'll go watch it, come back and listen to this. Uh, but uh, the film itself gives plot spoilers right at the start, uh, because you can clearly see that, uh, like, the members of the team, like, dying, um at the yeah. start in the highlight package of the film. Well, certainly Christian Scott Thomas's character, uh, Sarah, um, who is stabbed in the highlight package of the opening of the film. You're like, oh, oh, right. So she's going to die soon, I, I guess. That seems weird that you're revealing that to me now, but okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> well, and that's where it kind of feels like a, the nod to a TV series in a way. Yes, it does. Yeah. 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 And, is, and also like pacing, like the, the way we pace stories then, like when you're watching a movie in the mid nineties, like that, like information being thrown at you that fast, you almost don't process, you know, movies, movies were in the midst of changing quite a bit in that decade. But yeah, like, I, I mean, if my dad was sitting down and watching pretty much anything that happens in those opening credits, he'd be like, oh, I don't know what any of that meant. All right. It's like visual <laughs> non sequiturs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a fair point because, like, in terms of like the speed of storytelling, um, there there is a clear difference between like this film and like uh, you know like the likes of Fallout, and it's hilarious that um, of the many of the original cast members who like turned down roles in this movie, 
um, like uh, Martin Landau was was one of them, and one of the, his kind of things that one of his reasons that he turned it down was oh it's it's too it's too action based, you know, like the series is more kind of spy series mind games, you know, like it's you know it's, it's more to do it's more more to do with that. It's not it's not this kind of fast actiony thing. Whereas like if you compare this to like modern blockbusters, it's like oh well, this is like a measuredly paced. Uh, yeah tinky spy thriller you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah paul greengrass is not making this movie <laughs> <laughs> that that is that is a, a very fair point it's not going a million miles there um but uh yeah you know, that's the other thing yeah the some of the original cast members uh were reached out to to like for this film but like turned it down including peter graves who played the original jim phelps in the, they, in the original they wanted film. him to play jim phelps in this yeah 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 but he turned it down because when he found out the re- the reveal um which we'll mm-hmm. talk about um he didn't like that he saw it as a as a betrayal of the show and he didn't he didn't want that i like also um if peter graves had played Jim uh, uh, Jim Phelps, I wonder if they would have still hired Emmanuel Bert to be his wife because Peter <laughs> Graves is even older than jo- Peter Graves. The late Peter Graves has uh, yeah. passed passed away some years ago, but um, he was born in 1926, so he's like a full 12 years older than John Voight. So De Palma would have made it work. <laughs> <laughs> Because you, know, you have like a, in that case, you would have had like a seventy-year-old man <laughs> married to a thirty-three-year-old. Like, I don't. <laughs> oh yeah, that would never fly in a Hollywood film. Yeah, no, no, I get it. I get it. No, I, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. It's like the um, it's like the crazy age difference between uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones and Sean Connery and Entrapment. And you're like, Come on yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, like yeah. all those all those cast members of the show really like they were not shy about expressing their uh dismay at the film and I know like some of them walked out. I think I don't know if they were at the premiere or not, but like <laughs> walked out before it was done because they just thought yeah. it was very disrespectful to the original series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I I, I you know, reading about it, um it seems like um at the time there was uh, fans of the original series who who really didn't like some of the plot twists that, that happened uh, yeah. in, in this movie and uh, were, were not. Um, had some of the similar complaints to, to Martin Lander and also had a uh, uh, complaint connected to a reveal that we will not. <laughs> Fair. Um, so, uh, but we next, have Voight on a plane. <laughs> next, we have Voight on a plane. Yes, because in this movie... I am tired of these motherfucking voids on this motherfucking plane. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) And we get uh, some fun spy games because we found out that Jim Phelps is not a fan of cinema. He he prefers (laughs) theatre, but he is interested in Ukrainian cinema. Aren't we all? (laughs) And of course, this is where he he gets the, the mission and famous... Mission Impossible style. Before we head off to Prague, and and like being a you know kind of nineties action movie, we're told it's uh, told all these things at the bottom of the screen, like like in any spy movie, really. You know, like uh, you're always told where you are, um, so you know you can always keep tabs. Um, and uh, basically, after Jim Phillips get his gets his mission, uh, then he imparts that mission uh, to his team, which is made up of Ethan Hunt. Uh, you know, played by Tom Cruise, obviously, and um, Jack Harmon, uh, played by Amelia Estevez, uh, Sarah Davies, played by Kristen Thomas, uh, Kristen Scott Thomas, and uh, Amelia Claire, played by Emmanuel Burt, and uh, oh, there's another team member. Oh yeah, Hannah, um, who is just, I mean, a character who barely registers at yeah. all. Um, it's like ah, oh, she's she's there and and then and, and she's not. Yeah. Um, uh, but I don't know how many lines does Hannah have? Like like two lines or something. She's up in the balcony at one point and she says, "Yeah, a couple." When she says, "Uh, he's in pocket." Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I That's genuinely right. don't know if she has a second line. Yeah. And I really don't know how you say her name. I'm looking at it on IMDb and it is all. Oh, 
<laughs> Ingeborg, <laughs> I, yeah, it's something like Ingeborg uh, da Kapkunit. Da Kunit. Yeah. In- Ingeborg uh, da Kunit. Um, that's... Yes, that's my best. I'm sorry if I've mangled that name. I um, know. I I I applaud you. I applaud your effort. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then we get the flashback of her when Ethan is kind of figuring everything out, which will happen later. Right. But then that's that is true. it. But I, I will say, and I know we talked about this prior, that and I don't know, I there is this kind of comfortability uh, with the team that I really liked, and they're kind of joking with each other, and they're joking with um, Jim. And kind of talk about how, oh, he was sipping on champagne or whatever, having this luxury, time of luxury and all this stuff. And no, it, it felt, it felt authentic in this way. And it also, it really makes you, you know, especially knowing what will happen in just like five or 10 minutes. You're like, yeah, man, (laughs) I, I wish they drew this out more or something Mm -hmm. because especially Cruz and Estevez work really well together. And I know we, yeah, we mentioned this prior. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's yeah, an interesting, absolutely. now that you mention it, there is a really interesting thing. Cause like Luther eventually re- replaces, you know, Jack in yeah. the, in the function of basically the team's IT guy. And yeah, like Ethan seems to have like an appreciation for IT. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, and you feel the, especially when we get into what happens, you feel the weight when he comes yeah. across, um, every time he comes across one of his teammates and I don't know, it just, it makes it all the better, I guess, of why moving forward instead of if you just saw them all killed and then we didn't right. go on and whatever. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but like uh, Jack seems to be a, a, a bit. Uh, he he, do, he does kind of different things because he is a kind of hacker IT guy, but he also gives Ethan the explosive gum. So like, it seems like he is also Ethan's cue at the same time as well, <laughs> because sure. or, or just like uh, Bond needs to use everything given to him by Q. You know that explosive gum is. Yeah. yeah, but how many pieces did he give him? Because yeah, I thought it was only the one. And then... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, maybe off camera he gave him. He gave yeah. him. He gave him the whole pack. <laughs> on the pack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes. You know. There, there we go. That's another mystery solved. You know, like, yeah. like, like, like earlier complaint. Like, the, do you know what? Done. Like, it's the, it's the weird things you notice on, on rewatch because I've seen this movie a bunch of times. And like, one of the weird things it was like, um, uh, when Jim is giving like the the debrief of like uh, what's going to happen, um, he when he's saying like when they need to regroup, he's like we need to regroup at. Uh, you know, like, uh, he, he says, like, 4 a.m., like, in a couple of different ways. And I was like, that seems entirely unnecessary. It's like, 4 o'clock, <laughs> yeah. 4 a.m., 4 o'clock, that's, 4 a.m. That's 0400. Like, what? What? <laughs> Stop saying that. It's, it's yeah. fine. We understand. <laughs> <laughs> They're a team of professionals. They'll get it. With Jim them. Phelps is getting a little old. He's getting a little dodgy in the head, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, that's it, yeah. He says, like, oh, 0400. That's 4 a.m. It's like, yeah, we know. <laughs> So next up we have that crew, well, Ethan Hunt is in a disguise, but we don't know what he is specifically because it's his POV while Jim is kind of running the show from a computer and telling each person where to go and how to handle. I do love that, like, they didn't even have, like, okay, we're going to have a person play this and then Tom Cruise, like, we'll have them again. Like, it's just Tom yeah. Cruise in a mask yeah. already <laughs> as, some, as the senator. <laughs> yes, yeah, because when you see the TV interview, you're like, oh, it's- He's in a mask. He's just don't. Yeah. He's, like, yeah. he's in a mask. He's a, like they didn't have like a separate act. That's fine. And then you <laughs> see, the, yeah, you see the sequels later on where you're like, oh, Tom Cruise is underneath a mask that is Philip Seymour Hoffman, who's right. definitely <laughs> they don't share the same body type at all. Well, yeah. So, okay. Well, we'll just talk about it now, right? That is my number one silliest thing in the, the, the Mission Impossible franchise. That once you put the mask on, you also take on the same height and body type as the person you're impersonating. I, I don't want to blow your mind, but Mission Impossible takes place in the Potterverse and magic is real. Yeah. Oh, okay. Fair enough. That explains, that explains everything. 
of like of all like I don't mind like when action movies are, are are silly in terms of like oh this couldn't possibly they couldn't possibly survive that fall and that explosion and and you know walk around normally while they've got a gunshot wound in their shoulder or whatever but like the one thing that amuses me most is like why does he like how is he the same height and weight as these people? Like, or what? Right. How does that happen? You're just wearing a mask, right? <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, I truly love, I mean, he's my favorite actor anyway, but Philip Seymour Hoffman playing Tom Cruise, playing him, <laughs> is just one of my favorite things. You know, when he's just like very sternly putting up the one minute you know, finger while he coughs because he can't, you know, the voice simulation hasn't happened yet. Like, I can't even explain it. I just love that moment because he genuinely seems like Tom Cruise, like, in the face. And it's like, that's weird. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that that was a good thing. (laughs) <laughs> and, and so the uh, the plan seems to be going well for the most part. They're able to get down into the basement to kind of set up the so they can get the evidence on the ambassador to get so that he's getting the NOC list. But then all these kind of weird little glitches are arising in terms of the technical issues. And, but they're able to kind of escape out the back door to let, you know, this guy take the phone. (laughs) No security in the back door. Nope. (laughs) (laughs) This this big, you know, extravagant event with all these people. And they're just like, they walk right out. Nobody even does anything. It's actually... No, I mean, like, uh, famously, U.S. embassies never put anybody at the back door. Yeah. (laughs) And then they this just... is a very important <laughs> lesson, though, because, like, when you're writing, you want to try to, like, you're like, oh, I got to explain everything. It's like, honestly, you don't. No. Like, as long as it feels right, audiences were down. They are yeah, down to sure. clown. Yeah, 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 yeah. For, <laughs> sure, for sure, for sure. And it has the one way to escape any sort of suspicion is that you fake kiss each other. <laughs> yes. And everybody's like, oh, okay. Well, they're the, just. The prudish couple <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of Prague. You know, like, oh, we were gonna, we were going to ask, you know, what you're doing here, but clearly you're necking, so yeah. <laughs> carry on. We, it would be improper of us to interrupt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so like, one of the things I was gonna, gonna talk about as well, uh, is like once they, you know, escape the back door and like shit starts to go sideways, and people start dying and uh, jack is killed and the, the elevator shaft just the, the elevator just goes right off and he's he's skewered in the a face hor- yeah a horrific um, death for a pg-13 yeah Looking really oh really wow horrific Gee, death for a PG, yeah. i also um, have questions about that system of stopping an elevator like why do they have knives yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but whatever <laughs> yeah no 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 i mean like watching it this time i, I always like as, as, a, as a kid i was just always like oh that's a kind of cool grisly moment like like, um, but you know, yeah, watching it, and I was like, "Why is that at the top of the?" <laughs> I don't know. Um, moving on, um, but yeah. also, like, um, you know, there's just certain scenes in this movie that you're just like, "Oh, this is just well done, this film. This is just beautifully filmed." Yeah. Um, so when Sarah is like just walking through the fog in the streets of Prague, oh, it's just like, yep. "Oh, that's just beautifully filmed." Yeah. Yeah. Sarah is definitely the one. As much as I like Jack, and we've talked about that, I, Sarah was the other one, especially this time watching it. I was like, "Man, I, I wish she was around longer." <laughs> I wish they did more with her in this part. Yeah, they really yeah. waste Kristen Scott Thomas here. Yeah, because then her death, but her death, you really feel it probably more than the other ones when he's holding her. And he, yeah, all '90s action on the record. Brian De Palma good at directing. Kristen Scott Thomas good at acting. Yeah, <laughs> We're really, really taking some stands here. <laughs> yeah. We, as a show, as a show, we're very much known for our hot takes, and uh, these hot takes are spicy today. <laughs> Tell you what, this Brian De Palma movie, very visually dynamic. <laughs> it's yeah. accurate. In more shock news. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what happens to Hannah? Oh, dear. Uh, Hannah, that, that character that we're really deeply invested in, um, is blown up in a car. Um, yeah. Which he thinks, um, uh, two of them, uh, that's uh, both Hannah and Claire. Yeah, Claire are blown up. What he 
assumes. Yes. So he, at this point, he, he assumes that. Like, yeah, they really do give the most weight to um, uh, Sarah's death. Yeah. Because they just um, they realize Jack's dead, and they just kind of make a funny face and kind of move on. Yeah. Um, and and is the same with like um, Hannah and uh, uh, possibly Claire's. Maybe, maybe not. Um, death is kind of like, oh, you know, we got. I got shit to do. Um, I, you know, I got I got running. To do. <laughs> um, so like, but they, they like give like uh, uh, real weight to to Sarah's death. That's that's another interesting thing. So um, like once he kind of sees that that Jim is dead, um, that he's been shot, and he runs he runs to the Charles Bridge in in Prague. Uh, you know, to, to see you know like that Jim's oh he's fallen off the bridge. Um, and um, that is that's really and then he runs to a telephone to, to phone uh, Kittard and and that's really pretty much it on the running yeah. front um, which is surprising for a Mission Impossible movie there's a, there's, a very little running in this movie hadn't figured out the brand yet yeah. no they hadn't figured out the formula of like there is just something for some reason, there is just something visually satisfying about watching Tom Cruise <laughs> running on screen. I remember uh, nobody knows why. <laughs> Somebody, I think they did a compilation of all of his running moments for from all of his like action movies, and since then you cannot unsee yeah. any of it. And they did it in reverse or something. <laughs> <laughs> and like when the, when I was watching this. I hit display at this point. We are uh, we are thirty minutes in to an hour and fifty minute movie. Yeah. It is lean. It moves, but like because I remember hitting that point, and I was just like, "How far in are we?" You yeah. know, because at this point, mo- the pacing of movies are so different. And it's just like, yeah, you know. So, dear listener, I know we take fucking forever to talk about the first 10 minutes of a movie but we're already into a half hour like we're already a quarter of the way through this thing so don't worry it's not as bad as you're thinking yeah. <laughs> that is true that, that, that is true this movie shifts and, and we, yeah. we, we can we can yeah. shift through this movie uh pretty uh pretty swiftly i mean like uh you know I mean, if you listen to the show before, you know, you know, it's it's there's going to be tangents. There's going to be both. <laughs> uh, but we will we will give you information as well. Information right. such as the restaurant that they go to that um, Ethan Hunt goes to. Aquarium, um, not a restaurant in Prague. No, that was a cell. Uh, a, what, what did I say there? It's a set. That was a wow. set built at Pinewood Studios. And that okay. is definitely a production design choice because the exterior yeah. is a oh no it's the shot when he's running out and the water is cascading when it's the shot with the r- restaurant behind the camera that was shot in Prague yes but yeah you're right the yeah the no the actual is a set the actual the... restaurant front um, which is like yeah um, basically a series of fish tanks <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like. Uh, I, I I I would love to have been in the production meeting of like oh we need our restaurant where where they they meet you know it can just be like a normal restaurant and then one person is like how about if it wasn't a normal restaurant how about <laughs> if it was like kind of like a Bond villain lair um, and it's gonna be like a series of fish tanks uh, throughout oh yeah I, I suppose that would also work we were just thinking of like just a normal restaurant yeah. that you meet but. Sure. Yeah. 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 Well, it's also just like at this point, it, looking back, it's so quaint that like, th- like one of the big stunts that Tom Cruise does himself is running amidst, amidst water. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a fair <laughs> point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and, absolutely. absolutely. And then it's, you know, in Fallout, he's strapped to a a plane, whatever. That's the, Rogue Nation. I Rogue Nation. Yeah. Fallout's uh, the one where he does the Halo jump. Yes. Yes. The, yeah, 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 yeah. The new one. I told you it gets that. confusing, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so he meets with Kittredge, and what he finds out is that the whole mission that they were supposed to have was basically a decoy mission. And that there was no information on that would have been come from the disc. And the fact that because there was a mole potentially within their team and it all points to Ethan, who is the only survivor that they know of. And a lot of money went into his parents' account. So 
That's when Ethan says the line that Adam said earlier of you've never seen me upset. And he gets to use the gum because if he's going to be going down, he's going to have to go rogue. One of the key components of a Mission Impossible movie. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because um, he is, uh, we later find out um, for the first time, he has been disavowed (laughs) this movie's this franchise's dun, 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 favorite dun, dun, word dun, dun, in the dictionary. Dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> <Do-do-do>. <laughs> we should make a no-budget version of this called Disavowed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> should do the Roger Corman thing. Come oh, on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, should, we totally <laughs> Let's should. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Is this before or after our Copland miniseries that we yeah. were pitching to um, uh, Netflix? <laughs> Which, whichever yeah. one gets us the money. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. 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 <laughs> look at look out for disavowed in cinemas, twenty twenty three. Oh, ah, dude. Um, but before we like, um, before he he says that he says those iconic word, that iconic word that he's been disavowed. Where we have uh, some plot mechanics to deal with. Yes. Uh, so he he gets back to the hideout. And he is trying to find out who who uh, job is, and um, but then that doesn't come before the restaurant because uh, no 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 he comes, comes the... no he comes after the, the okay. when he's, yeah, yeah. it comes yeah. after the restaurant he he goes back to the hideout after he runs out of the restaurant yeah. uh, and then he's trying to find out who 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 job is and then and then he realizes and then he sees you know like handily he sees. Uh, a copy of the Bible, and he's like, "Oh, not Job uh, uh, three fourteen, but um, but Job three fourteen, yeah." Uh, yeah. Um, and then he he manages to to crack that code, and then I has, love like, apparently emails. an exhausting night of emailing. Like he's yeah. just different like, languages. Just yeah. See this kind of montage of scenes of him typing at a computer, and they're just mopping sweat off his brow. And I was like, I mean, that's some. I've you know sent a lot of emails in a day, and it's never it's never had to. <laughs> I love that UI though. I love that email <laughs> user interface. It would it would feel so satisfying if you're like writing an email to somebody and then it goes like a letter off and you know. Has oh no, the, that'd be cool. Yeah, I really oh, like love that it. too. Yeah, it's brilliant. Nineties internet like or the internet in nineties movies just fantastic. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I have some good good stuff. I will say I re this is not connected at all, but yeah, no, I agree. I rewatched Hackers. I was like, man, yes. I'd love to see a movie that is just like a throwback to all the 90s hacking movies where it's not like connected in at all to what hacking really is and just all of the joys that was I don't, <laughs> I don't know if you follow Sarah Benincasa on Twitter, but like okay. it's like one of her things is, is just to remind the world that Sneakers is a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it makes me so happy. Like, yeah, Sneakers was awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember being a kid and watching the shit out of that movie. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, I, I enjoy I enjoy that movie as well. Yeah, <laughs> 90s hacking is, is like uh, we did um, an episode back in season two uh, on Assassins, and um, it has oh, some boy. fun uh, 90s <laughs> yeah. hacking in it. As Julianne Moore plays a, plays a hacker character. <laughs> That looks like very much um, like a, a Wachowski sister character. You know? She's got the, she's got all the the leather jacket and all the cool shades and all the you know like um, very on brand Wachowski. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose like in terms of like movie hacking, like you know the, in the nineties it got like more and more ridiculous the kind of movie hacking as compared to hacking in real life, and then it like. It reached peak ridiculousness with swordfish, and then nothing could really top like <laughs> oh, the stupidity Lord, yeah. of that. So like they they just left it alone. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. can't rejump the shark. No, yeah. <laughs> no, you can't. You can. <laughs> yeah, I remember when what um, Michael Mann's Black Hat came out, and watching it and being like, oh man, this one, this isn't fun hacking. I want something fun. <laughs> I've oh, also listened dear. to Sam Esmail talk so many times about like. The crappy hacking and or the crappy portrayal of, of hacking in movies is like what prompted Mr. Robot. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, enough about things that aren't Mission Impossible. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, uh, thanks for getting us out of Tangent Corner there, Adam. Uh, we're back. We're back with this movie. And Claire shows up. We forgot to Claire make, shows up. doing his email. But she's dead. <laughs> yeah. Now, like, um, you know, we talked earlier uh, uh, about uh, about four o'clock. Now, uh, so Emmanuel Burr um, has her kind of Oscar moment. Earlier, uh, Tom Cruise had his <laughs> Oscar moment. So Tom Cruise's Oscar moment, what we didn't talk about, is when he phones Kitteridge. And he's like, you don't understand. The team's dead. The list is in the open. And he's like, oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> And then, but we, we come back to where we are. Emmanuel Burt has her Oscar moment, where she just rises about on the bed, going four o'clock, four o'clock. <laughs> After he's carefully broken a light bulb to to let him know when somebody's, you know, where are other spies always bad spies. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, I think his little system of like they'll sit, they'll step on the glass. And then he almost, yeah, <laughs> he almost shoots her. Yeah. She fell asleep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, right, because we have like, that. We, we yeah. have a kind of friendly moment where, like, it's it's, it's 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 actually a dream. It's all like, uh, oh, Jim's back from the from the dead. He's all bodied. Uh, oh no, it's it's just it's just a dream. We know it's a dream because like Jim's voice is in that kind of weird, echoey thing. You're like, ah, oh, he's definitely dreaming. Um, and then, oh, it's clear. I needed you, Ethan. <laughs> I needed you, Ethan. <laughs> Ethan, Ethan. <laughs> uh, but he does finally hear from Mac. The, he does indeed. The arms dealer, who, as Scott said, all the villains in the <laughs> franchise <laughs> are either arms dealers or ec- agents. And as we come to learn later, the franchise is is part of a family business, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> apparently uh, so. Apparently so. Uh, and then we uh, we go to meet Max, is, is where we're going to next. Uh, we get, um, he has to pick up a packet of Dunhills and then ask for a match um, from somebody at a bus stop um, playing more spy games. And we, we meet that person, we meet the henchman, and it's all done from uh, a POV. And uh, yeah, and then we get we jump into the car. Um, he's put a like a balaclava over his head so he can't see. And then he, I mean, he's a very smooth talker because uh, basically the henchmen are like, no, no, Max can't be seen by anybody. And then he's like, oh, you know, I can't, I can't be doing my talking uh, through this balaclava. And then Max is just like, yeah, sure, whatever, okay, <laughs> take it, take it off. It's like. Oh well, that was. I think the it was oh. like the writers and the producers and the director in the room just like, well, I mean, of course he has to like have a sack put over his head when you go to. It's like, yeah, but it's Tom Cruise. We're not we're not going to keep a sack over his head. Like, <laughs> just get it off of him. Like whatever. Ha- like just say whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's it's a fair point. It's like, oh, this is the the big star of our movie. We're not going to have like a long scene where he talks through a balaclava. Well, that's we need to see that million dollar smile. God damn it. And so when he gets off, he she is testing this floppy disk, and he is pretty much saying that oh they're gonna he's giving a time frame that oh it's not real and they're the list is going to be a fake and it's just going to have a kind of tracking device that they're going to be here in what about five minutes or and he's going through it and you can kind of see this bluff between the two of them of or is she going to call his bluff or is it real and it's a great little tension moment and then you start seeing that there are agents under Kittredge who then kind of break in but they are already gone and Kittredge just loves to yell at Barnes for some reason <laughs> yeah uh, so like in this whole sequence there's a couple of weird things that I noted in my uh, in my notes that I, I wrote first of all uh, when they're checking out the floppy disk um, I wrote down could have wiped the blood off that disc. <laughs> just, yeah. just, like they, they, I mean, they've had that disc. You know, they picked up a wee while ago. You know, like um, I mean, it seemed like the obvious thing to do, but not just a bloody disc. And How will the audience also, know that it's the same disc? Yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, 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 yeah, obviously, a, a visual <laughs> signifier. Like that's that's the filmmaker in you, there, Adam. That's obviously you've, you've trumped <laughs> me once again. Um, 
also like um uh, i i love noticing like extras who are, who are really beefing up their part there's a guy who um is at the other side of the hall uh to um to try and get uh, max who we, we found out is actually maxine played by deliciously played by vanessa yeah. redgrave and uh, when uh, kitteridge is uh, chewing out barnes that same guy with the silence of pistol is just like walking back and forth in the hallway like kind of te- <laughs> like just doing like different poses with the silencer pistol and i'm like that's that's you know you've just you're really trying to get a bit of screen time now <laughs> <laughs> i will give it to max that um no she is an played very charming and there is actually a lot of especially watching it this time i'm like man there's a lot of sexual tension going on you could cut with a knife between her and ethan oh yeah for sure which like especially considering as the film goes on because there is no sexual tension between him and emmanuel barrett um and then like there's the idea of tension (laughs) between him and danny newton but like really until rebecca ferguson there isn't anything really between him and another and like a female character even though in every movie women are falling in love with him constantly yeah you know and yeah that's it was it was like interesting like oh hey there was a time when you know i mean now i hope ethan and ilsa are having a lot of fun together but uh yeah like and then, i mean just vanessa redgrave like playing it with a a wink and him playing it with a wink it's like man this this works <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, because, like, that's the only... I mean, that's the only sexual chemistry I believe in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. By far. I mean, <laughs> even though Jack really wanted sexual chemistry with Sarah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, that, that is true. He he was uh, hitting on Sarah to start a movie, and, and um, Sarah was not having any of it. Um, I, I mean, Jim and Claire are husband and wife, and they don't even have any sexual chemistry. <laughs> But that's on John Boy. That is on John Boy. <laughs> it's your point, Scott, is a very good one. Like that, her her little scene of like four hundred, Ethan, oh, four o'clock, oh four hundred, four a.m. Like you've got man, you know, Manon of the Spring, and just man, she gets, she does not do anything in this movie. Mm-hmm. It is, she is there to look pretty. That is it. Which I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I guess with De Palma, it's not a huge surprise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but, I mean, yeah, I mean, she is she is there to um, just look uh, kind of sexy uh, and pouty and talk in that kind of erotic, whispery voice. But yeah. yeah, because even when the missions come up, she ends up she's either the driver, which we never see her actually do any of the driving, or um, Jean Renault and um, what Ving Rhames. They are the ones that can take the front seat and then she just kind of is she's watching everything or something squirts the shit into a yeah. guy's oh, yeah. drink and yeah 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 poor claire <laughs> oh yeah uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah like if you had just seen a manual it's a bit like when we did the batman forever episode where i was like if uh, if you'd just seen nicole kidman in this film you'd, you'd think she was not a, a good actress i'm like <laughs> if you'd just seen emmanuel Bert here you'd probably think like oh She's not much, but like she's good in other films. Yeah. Um. <laughs> what if we just took the zany scenes from Moulin Rouge and made that a psychiatrist? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We we discussed <laughs> enough of that film. In that yeah. <laughs> so. But I wasn't there then. So. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, no, that's 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 true. That's true. <laughs> so I, I was just meaning from my, I, I, like in terms of my comeback, I wasn't going right. to add to that yeah. because like. Gotcha. <laughs> so he tells Max he will get her the actual, the true list for enough of a price, which causes him to have to build a new team, which is where we get to meet Luther and Krieger. Played by Marcellus Wallace. Yeah. I yeah. love that he actually like looks like, like he's dressed like Marcellus Wallace at one point in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Makes me very, very happy. Yes. That is yeah. So so we meet our, our you know our also disavowed agents because we need to find more disavowed agents um, to work with because obviously he can't work with official sources because the government believes that he is the mole, um, and and those disavowed uh, agents are 
you know, as you said, Marcellus Wallace and uh, <laughs> Leon, the professional. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but reverse because this version of Leon is very trigger happy, and yeah, that is true. Marcellus Wallace is a just a nice, friendly guy. <laughs> <laughs> cuddly marcellus wallace yeah and psycho leon yeah and um basically ethan tricks them both into joining them by like kind of flaunting their reputations in front of them and being like well i heard on the grapevine from the you know like secret underground service grapevine that you could do all this cool shit but now i don't believe it so much and they're like well we can and i will prove it i will get the thing in 24 hours and yeah i can oh, yeah. anything <laughs> it's right. i guess since it's been a while this would be a question for adam so with luther he's supposed to be the hacker tech guy so how does in the later sequels he kind of takes a back seat and becomes almost like a the driver and the I don't know, because Simon Pegg becomes kind of the hacker. Well, so Luther is very happy to just be. He also is like because he is reavowed. I don't know. Uh, he's brought back in. So like I know in Rogue Nation he's on another mission oh, and okay. like hacks a satellite in order to like help them. Um, Benji is wanting to be a field agent. So he gets a bit more like active, and Luther is very comfortable to just sit at his laptop. Okay, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's why I was trying to remember watching. It. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he is still like basically like yeah, Benji's in the field with you know, like I think my favorite thing is in Rogue Nation when he has the book that's a computer. You know, oh, yeah. like the pages. I just I love that device. I, it's oh, I love it. Um, but yeah, it, there's a bit of redundancy, but at the same time, like we've become so internet centric and so tech centric as a society that it kind of works to have two people okay. that can do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, it works for me. <laughs> <laughs> you can now see like Scott sent out a list of like, oh, these are all the movies we're going to cover. And like literally my email back was like, I'm fine with these, but I have to be on Mission Impossible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yes, I remember that. <laughs> Yeah, I, you are I always seeing knew. why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always knew you. I had to have you on this one. Yeah. So that's... Yeah. <laughs> it's so yeah. Even at the beginning here, it seems like him and Luther. Right, yeah, right from the bat, um, that Luther is the one that he can trust the most, and yeah. you don't know why, and I don't think he even knows why. But for some, yeah, yeah, him and Krieger sure. kind of start butting heads because. Krieger only wants the money, and there's all these kind of random questions, and he was found by Claire. But yeah, yeah. he's specifically him and Luther kind of buddy up. I, I love that Krieger's just like, you're not going to meet anyone without me. Like, ah, uh, this is not your lane. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is wildly presumptuous, sir. <laughs> Whereas Luther just seems to be over at a bar, like, I don't know what these crackers are talking about. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, but we move on with the film and we get, and I need to, every time it happens, um, I've done it in block caps and we need to say it again. <laughs> that theme tune happens when we cut back to that America. That theme. That theme. <laughs> 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 We're heading back to Lively, for the, Virginia, for the, head of the CIA. For the legacy sequence. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolute fucking lately. And this, I mean, like, yeah. you know, first time I saw it as a kid and watching it again today, this sequence is just amazing. Yeah. So, like, yeah. Ethan kind of sets out, we get all these kind of, like, flashes to uh, head, CIA headquarters of, like, um, we get the kind of classic heist scene where we're you know we're talking about the heist we're you're we're talking about how the the heist has to you know the security checks that we have to get through and all all this kind of stuff and then uh, we get into we get a false fire alarm that's how they get into the building they're dressed up as firemen and they have to get into an air vent um they manage to do that they have to like knock out a security guard which krieger nearly kills but ethan's like no this is zero kill count we gotta you know like um we gotta do it clean and uh then they, they get up into the vent and then yes 
the uh, the pro- probably maybe the most iconic uh, scene from any of the Mission Impossible movies, and one of the most iconic scenes of the nineties is mm-hmm. them uh, this this scene. So, uh, like, um, does uh, do either of you want to take it break down this scene for us? Before we do, that's an interesting <laughs> point. I yeah. want to ask the listeners, like, when this goes out, what are the most iconic action sequences from the 90s? What are your top five, top ten? But what do you think are the best action sequences of the 90s? I mean, the ones that I know would come up a lot are this. I would say from Heat, the when they're running down the street spraying guns and the, or like shooting at the cops and everything. And then yeah. I'm not sure. I know those well, two I mean, are like, always talked about. And then, yeah. I think, um, like, I, I, again, like, because... I, I, he's a kind of funny one because, like, I don't necessarily yeah. think of that as an action movie. Like, some people do, some people don't. So that's a that's a real kind of split thing. So we might get that. Um, I think the ones that might come up a lot would be um, the the explosion of the White House in Independence Day. Oh yeah. Um, the the motorbike the the motorbike chase. In Terminator 2, when they're getting chased by the truck. Yeah, yeah. That's um, the one that I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to think. Trying to think I, other I, ones. I don't. From... I don't think it would, but I almost want to say something from Cliffhanger, just because of how. But then I don't know what specific part. I just and like, feel like I mean, obviously the Matrix figures in, but yeah. like, which scene would you choose? Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, probably um, either. Like, yeah, I think the Matrix would definitely fit. I think, like, I think the scene that that, that people would choose is, is the scene um, where they 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 go into the building towards the end. That's well, like the big yeah. fight. Like when they good. when they go through. Um, and the metal detector goes off and he pulls out all the guns and, like, shit just kicks off. I, yeah. yeah, I think maybe that. I, I but would... honestly, I, like, I remember, and I really, like, all the clear memory of this, but, like, the first time I saw it in the theater, when the helicopter goes into the building and the glass kind of spherically explodes. Oh, yeah. Like, I remember that just, like, I felt my mind get blown. <laughs> like, I, yeah, I okay. literally was just like, oh, I've never, like, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that i think there's a few from the matrix i think the matrix would definitely figure in I, there um like that helicopter one poss- uh, what, possibly um, i know the when he bent the where he's like dodging the bullets just because it was parried right. so much yeah yeah, yeah. The, the bullet time thing yeah yeah here's a totally random one but the be- the first scene of the last Boy Scout, like I can see very clearly in my head, the the football player that like he's oh, the running yeah. back and he runs, he scores a touchdown, and then he pulls out a gun and says "Ain't life a bitch" and kills himself. It is the very first scene of that movie, but like I remember that making a very big impression. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's, fucking podcast is about '90s action. That seems like a question to ask our listeners. Yeah, yeah. no, no, I, I, absolutely, <laughs> I, absolutely. I, I think like the the big. Um... Uh, I, I, again, I don't know because like um, it depends like what people watch because there's there's yeah. there's some things that are probably bigger in my head than they they are like in terms of like their popular appeal like the big like hospital finale and hard boiled like re- oh, comes yeah. to my mm. mind but like I don't know if that is like popular yeah. mainstream enough that it comes to a lot of people's mind I don't know maybe it is. I think in the state, I don't know. I don't think hard boiled because John Woo didn't really get as big in the states, except with like um, well because face of face, off yeah, and, face yeah. off he did, but his um, broken arrow, yeah, his other stuff didn't really, except with yeah. like, his cinephiles and things like that. Right, I feel like yeah. Um, <laughs> Weirdly, the you know, I mean, it's two thousand, but Mission Impossible too. Yeah, um, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. I, I, know. I know. It's weird. Uh, Oh, the finale of Con Air when they crash in Vegas. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. It, and I guess, like, the kiss with the nuclear explosion and True Lies. Yeah. Oh, That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. That was a <laughs> huge tangent. But uh, just, yeah, like, we are getting into, you know, so, yeah, they get to Langley and all the shit that they've just, like, that Tom Cruise has just said, like, we have to do this, and then there's this, and these are all the precautions, and, you know, and they're basically just telling us, you know, it's, it's one of the things I love about writing is just, like, 
All right. Well, we've come up with an idea. So here's why it's impossible. Um, the, the floor, you can't touch it. And if it rises above the decibel uh, level of this, which is apparently still loud enough for a computer to, you know, re- copy its entire thing. Onto, like those, I remember those, those disk drives, they were not quiet. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but like, yeah. And this is, Oh, and it, you know, the, the temperature, which really never figures in, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, they, they kind of set up like, this is all the stuff. And then it's really just like Tom Cruise goes to the circus as, as a trapeze artist for, you know, a few minutes and that, you know, him running away from water was the one stunt. And then this is the other where on the, on the Blu-ray, they talk about like, Oh yeah, it was really like, if they had dropped him, that would have hurt. And it's like <laughs> cut to him strapping himself to the outside of a plane a few years later. But uh yeah, he, they get to Langley. They get past, they have the fire, the fake fire alarm. They get into the building, they get up into the vents. They have a little device for the lasers that are protecting the vent, um, which seems like a very easy solve. But I don't know, they're spies. They got this shit. Uh, and yep. then, yeah, he drops down into the room. Uh, there's a guy, there's a CIA agent whose job is to stay in that room <laughs> and do something on that computer. I have no idea what. Uh, but you don't really care in the moment. Uh, no, you no. Playing... Like, you say, um, you know, like you said earlier about like you don't have to explain everything as long as it feels right. And yeah. it just, it's just like we don't need to know what this guy does. We just need to know that we need to get him out of the room and you know, we're going to do it in a fun way because we're going to give him this thing that just makes him sick. And I don't know if it's like just I'm older or whatever it is, but like when Emmanuel Baird sits down next to him, I was just noticing all the empty tables in that room and like that guy looking the way that he does. And then her looking the way that she does like that guy never is just like, wait, what? (laughs) Like, Oh, hi, you sat down right next to me, stranger. (laughs) Uh, Can I buy you a second cup of coffee? Like there's never any of that. She's just, you know, she sits right down she squirts some shit into his coffee. He has to go to the bathroom a lot and you know, after that, which keeps him out of the room with the computer so that Tom Cruise can do his trapeze thing. <laughs> um, and then, and which is also lovely that like Jean Reno, like even though they have all this high tech shit, it's still like Jean Reno holding <laughs> the rope of like, you know, and then like a mouse shows up and Jean Reno is like, no, I can't fuck with no mice. <laughs> <laughs> it's his Indiana Jones weakness, and uh, and that's that's the part when Tom Cruise almost hits the floor, and <laughs> only yeah. Don Ryan De Palma. Name me a second director that would be like, and then the sweat pools and drips, and like that is so much tension of sweat almost dropping on the floor. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, oh no, it's, it's amazing. So good. It's amazing the tension. <laughs> Another thing that like it really builds up the tension is there. It, you know, there's a great moment. Where like we're told like what's going to as the audience we're, we're kind of told what's going to happen because like Tom Cruise Ethan Hunt is like um, after John Renault's character uh, Krieger of France uh, Krieger like sneezes it's like now we need total silence yeah. and then the music cuts out and there is total silence apart from yeah. commentary you hear from outside of the room from uh, Luther and Claire. That's what I was just about to yeah. say is like you have Danny Elfman writing the score and you know, another movie, maybe you have very tense music, but like, no, just drop it away. It's so much worse when you're just, it's kind of like what happened with a quiet place. I remember seeing that in the theater and you had people with their huge bags of popcorn and very, like, <laughs> very quickly, like no one was eating, no one was drinking, no one could make a sound. And it's just like, man, I love it when a movie just like, takes everyone by the throat and it's like everyone shut up for a second <laughs> so tense um, oh it's amazing it, and it's it, like it's, yeah it's all these it's all these little moments it's like the yeah the moment of like the the beads of sweat the moment of the mouse which um apparently apparently krieger lets go of the rope uh kills the mouse and then gets it again because you see like the the mouse's little kind of you know, kind of dead body yeah. um, beside him. <laughs> um, and then there's a bit where the the rope kind of almost frays, and and you know he has to he has to get it back up again real quick. And um, 
Uh, yeah, and, and all all the little different things, man. It's it's great. And apparently, yeah. um, like, so he can do that kind of trapeze trick, uh, like for counterbalance, he, he put pound coins, British pound coins, in his shoes to get the right balance uh, going huh. on. Because otherwise, because it wasn't working. The first few takes he did, it wasn't it wasn't working. He kept like kind of falling down, and and you know, to, just to get the right kind of thing. Oh, I, so, yeah. I love the dams that Tom Cruise gives. Yeah, <laughs> he he gives the most fascinating dams. Yes. Uh, it, oh yeah, yeah. And so like you have all of that. You have, and I mean, we're we could have really just said the Langley sequence, and I feel like everyone listening to this podcast would be like, "Yep." But you have all of this. You have, and I mean, it's just a perfect realization. Uh, and they they get through it. They're getting out just as William is walking back in, and then Krieger drops his damn knife no. and <laughs> and really nothing like they still get out <laughs> yeah no it's, it's fine, it, it's fine. like it, again it just adds a little bit extra layer of tension because you get this slow-mo drop shot of the knife but then it just lands in the desk and they, they they scuttle away and it's all good like when brian de palma sadly passes on and there's tribute videos you know you've got to have fan of the paradise you've got to have uh, sisters, you've got to. I mean, he. You've got to have blowout. You, yeah, you know, the like final just, scene the, of blowout. The, is... the, uh, the 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 museum sequence in Dress to Kill. Yeah. Um, like, there's all these incredible. The the Frankie go, says Frankie goes to Hollywood sequence in Body Double. But like, the, say hello the, to my the, little the, friend from Scarface. Yeah, the the, the, the like, steps, the Potemkin steps scene in Untouchables. That's and, what I was about to say. It's like <laughs> the step scene and this and the Langley sequence, like. You know, he's had such an incredible career, but like those two things are him kind of at his best in like big budget filmmaking. Yeah. You know, you got to have prom from Carrie, but like, you know, if you put together a tribute and you don't have the Langley sequence, you did it wrong. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> that was fun. I haven't actually gotten to recount any plot in these things, uh, but like it was really fun to just kind of geek out for a second about that sequence. I, because I love it so much. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, then they leave Langley. Yeah. <laughs> so once they get out in their fire engine, then we find out that with the the agent, he ends up contacting Kittredge, which Kittredge goes kind of more hassling of Barnes, and then we find out that this guy is now going to be sent to Alaska or somewhere as far away as he can just for kind of messing up. And then we get into Krieger and his I, I just wanted to mention as well, like, I, again, just in terms of, like, the composition of some of these shots, I really like that you ha- that, that kind of close-up of, like, Kittredge and Barnes and the guy in the background. I just I, I just think it's a lovely... You lovely gotta have that split shot. diopter. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can't have a DePaul movie and not have a split diopter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, after that, we get to learn that Krieger is still very insecure, especially with the disc. And going back to what Adam was saying, that um, Ethan has magical abilities. <laughs> because <laughs> there's the whole sleight of hand sequence where he's saying, oh, I had two floppy disks. So this is that's not the one that actually has the information on it it's this one and he's you know making it disappear and yeah it goes through this whole sequence yeah no it's 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 quite fun how long this scene goes on yeah it's just like <laughs> uh, you know because you think it's just going to be a little bit kind of like oh oh i did this bit of sleight of hand but then he really does like a routine of it it was like oh where's the disc oh it's <laughs> in emmanuel bird's pocket but then i'm going to disappear again where's the disc oh it's in my back pocket and you're like oh okay you've proved your point you can do slightly like, <laughs> I, I didn't realize tom, you had this whole bit <laughs> tom cruise learned how to do that trick and he's like no 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 we're gonna do this for a while <laughs> yeah i yeah. love the extended scene of that where it's just like he finds it in like everybody's pocket it's like oh friends it's in your pocket now it's like okay you, you proved your point <laughs> yeah. but i think it goes back to like you know when what we were saying at the beginning of loving that's the the little bit of time we got with the team like yeah. one thing this movie does really well is live with them as people in these in-between moments yeah. You know, we're like, yeah, it's like, it's, oh, you're actually getting a sense of like who Luther is and who Krieger is. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it, yeah, it gets to the point that Krieger gets so frustrated that he just throws away the floppy disk and storms out, which then you find that he actually had the real floppy disk. And only Luther sees this when Ethan picks out the garbage and you kind of get more of this connection between Ethan and Luther. Where, which is yeah. <laughs> so superfluous because we see in the Langley sequence that he has two discs. Yeah. So we already know that he's ready to kind of like replace it or whatever. Like, so when, you know, he's like, Oh, you mean this disc? Like you don't need the beat of him. Like, Oh, did Krieger have the real one? Like, what the hell? Why did <laughs> any of that happen then? <laughs> it's so, like, is it all, is it all just because he wanted to do a sleight of hand scene? All right. Yeah, I, I think so. I think maybe that was it. Like, talking about things you don't really need, or something I thought was, there's a lot of this where, you know, people often talk about this movie and often says, oh, it's got a convoluted plot and it's kind of hard to follow. And there's things, you know, like, uh, you, you really have to focus on or, or, or whatever. So it doesn't kind of hold the audience by the hand in, in many respects. But in, in this this once, you know, in this kind of scene here, uh, where he has like the little reveal of he opens the Bible, it's a Gideon's Bible from the Drake Hotel in Chicago, yeah. which is where Jim Phelps is at. And this is where we kind of reveal it's like, oh, the, he must have been the mole all along, Jim Jim Phelps. Oh, maybe you know, like, he, he must not be dead. And um, so all, also we're in, we're in London now, we've been told at the bottom of the screen. Um, so, uh, yeah, but then there's like a little uh, callback, like audio from the start of the movie to be like, oh, I was in the Drake Hotel, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah, no, we, we I did watch the film, you know, like, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't need to be told that, that it's enough. The visual reveal is enough. You don't need the audio as well. That's such a note. Like, <laughs> that is such a note. I Like, when we were... Uh, the the ending of a ghost waits. There's a part where um, when Jack is alone and then the ghosts reappear and she says, "You have no one." Blah blah blah. That whole thing that was a an echo of what's said in the second dream. Um, we <laughs> originally like none of the reminder was there, and then people you know people weren't quite getting it, so we had to actually put like, "All right, let's put that shot back in there. Let's have her say this, you know, to remind people that this was a thing." <laughs> and it's like it really is just like sometimes you have to rem- remind people what happened forty minutes ago in a movie. Okay, okay, so, fair, fair yeah. enough. Like when you say that, such a note is that you saying. Scott, stop being a film critic jackass. Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. I I actually think it's a very fair point, Um, you know, because I I share your thing of like, I have been watching this. Like, you don't have to hold my hand, but a lot of people do need their hand held. And so when I say that's such a note, like I can see like a producer or somebody saying like, yeah, but like, are we supposed to remember that? And it's like, it was a half hour ago. (laughs) You, you're in a movie theater. (laughs) Why, why would you be distracted? (laughs) But you know, yeah. Yeah. All right. So what we pretty much get, what the fallout of that scene is he gives Luther the disc and even Luther says that, why should you even trust me? And then um, because Ethan is really suspecting Claire as well. And she makes the whole comment as which we already knew that she's the one who got Krieger and didn't know he was going to be like this. And she's sorry, but it leads into another big reveal about Jim. Right. Because he goes to call Kittredge. Yes. And while he's calling him in the booth next to him is a man in a overcoat and fedora with his back to us. And then he turns around and who is it? It's John Voight, Jim Phelps. But I, I actually, I really do like this, this little scene uh, in the way that it's shot. I mean, we've seen it before and, you know, after the fact too, where Jim is saying, oh, Kittredge is actually the mole and he's explaining it. And then you see Ethan piecing it together saying, oh yeah, Kittredge did this, but in his head, he's piecing together what the what actually happened and i think i don't know i always kind of enjoyed that scene of like oh yeah that's fun and we're we're seeing what's actually happening even though he's now working with jim of trying to make it seem like yeah i I am still on your side 
Yeah. Oh, and I love the little beat when, you know, he asks, when Ethan asks Jim, you know, why would Kittredge do this? And he, like, he answers why he did it. But, like, yeah, yeah. well, that Kittredge, he's just, you know, he's the president's running the country without his permission. And he's making 62000 and his marriage is shit. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> you married someone 25 years younger and you're amazed <laughs> it's not working? <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Not the point of this movie, but yeah. I know. <laughs> I, I like that touch as well where um, he uh, says his own motivation as, yeah. as uh, Kitchen's motivation. Oh, I was just thinking, I didn't think this uh, while watching the, the movie, but um, just you uh, saying uh, how he's dressed. I It's, um, you know, it'd be great if like, I, I mean... It, Obviously, uh, spies can't work like that in the real world because they're, you know, everybody would know what a spy looks like. It's like, <laughs> oh, who's right. that spy? Is it that guy in the fedora and the Mac over there? Oh, yeah, yeah. it's okay. <laughs> Is that three children in a trench coat? <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> so, okay, so. Uh, I made a note earlier because I really hadn't thought about it, but yep. when we were talking about the sequence where everybody dies, mm-hmm. uh, you specifically said, you know, and Claire, Ethan assumes. And it occurred to me that like this movie, the arc of like Ethan's arc in this movie is learning not to assume. Yeah. Because it's like, it's about the death of his innocence and the fact that like these people that he was so close to either died or betrayed him. And it's such a fascinating character study in a way of that, of just like by the end of this movie, you know, when you, and especially like going forward, he, he's so slow to trust and mm. which, you know, he's a spy. He shouldn't trust, but yeah. at the start of this, it seems like he's that Tom Cross, T- Tom Cross, Tom Cruise, puppy dog character of just like, Hey guys, what are we doing now? Where yeah. are we going? You know? And like yeah. by the end, he's just like, all right, I'm, Hold on a second. What, what, what's 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 going on with you? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why would I trust you? Yeah, I I, lo- I love that. It really hadn't occurred to me before. But like something about you saying Ethan mm. assumes is like, yeah. By the end of this, he doesn't assume anything. <laughs> yeah. no, that's a very. I like I, I I like that. I like that. It's like, like this is this movie is is the death of Ethan Hunt's innocent. I like that. Yeah. Uh, you know. Um, framing of it adam that's uh, but there was something else i wanted to mention about this the scene though um in terms of like the acting of the scene of you know him, him telling that that motivation as as kittredge's motivation but it's actually his own motivation um yeah. like at this point john voight is acting like a villain like yes. it, like yes, it's not much. officially been revealed. He is the you know like you know it, it it has been revealed to the audience. But you're supposed to you're supposed to be he's supposed to still be trying to fool Ethan that he's not the villain, and yet he's right. not. Like I have never <laughs> seen somebody take a painkiller in such an obviously evil manner <laughs> than John oh, Voight good. taking this painkiller for it for his. You know, apparently busted up, shot arm. Um, you know, it's just like yeah. you're supposed to be acting like you're still one of the good guys. You're, you're not. <laughs> it's a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he basically says, "I need, or you can't tell anybody I'm still alive until this mission is over, and then we'll figure it out." Also, yeah. such a weird little beat in this scene. I'm sorry, but like, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, as we have said. There is no sexual tension between Tom Cruise yes. and Emmanuel Barrett. But then <laughs> oh, yeah, he's like, true. Claire, I mean, who knows what she's had to do? And it's like, dude, I'm pretty sure it's like a week. <laughs> like, yeah. we, are, we are just days away from you know, with that happening. Uh, like, but he's like, oh, it's, it's got to be so hard on her. Who knows? And it's just like, he, and it, like, it didn't occur to Ethan to do anything before. And then he goes back and like, they fall onto a bed or whatever. And it's just like, well, but now he knows he's alive. Yeah. Like, what? Why? Where? Huh? <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, the whole t- yeah, for sure. I, and well, I- also, like, there, there is the beat where, like, he's still got his innocence because he's picturing what really happened in the uh, in the mission in his mind and he's getting all these things right. But yeah. when he pictures Hannah being blown up in the car, at first he pictures Claire being the one who detonates 
but then it rewinds because he's like, oh no, not Claire. Uh, and then and then it's um, yeah. it's uh, Jim detonating the car. Yeah. So he's still yeah. got his innocence. Yeah. And then she does. I don't know. Watching that part, especially <laughs> uh, she like does that weird kiss on his thumb. I was saying they're going, well, what? what? What's going on? Where's Max for this? Come on, bring Max back and have this sure. scene. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's a there's a few kind of weird beats with Emmanuel Burt as well because yeah. in that kind of um, when he's kind of piecing together what actually happened in the mission, when he pictures her blowing up the car, like Emmanuel Burt like looks di- like smolderingly directly into the camera for no reason and is like, right? Yeah, <laughs> like but, I'm evil. And, <laughs> and honestly, like. I get the mathematical formula of we're going to cast Emmanuel Bert and there will be sexual tension. Like I get that. <laughs> and it kind of reinforces the miracle that is Rebecca Ferguson as Ilsa Faust that like those two have genuine chemistry and they have a very specific kind of chemistry that is not entirely sexual, not entirely romantic, not entirely platonic. It really does seem like they just are puzzle pieces that go together um, yeah, no, I, like, no, I agree with that for sure. Yeah, it, it really is interesting. Like, they just have no fucking clue what to do with Claire. <laughs> not at, not not at all. all. Yeah, no, she's just anyway, floating around in the movie aimlessly. I'm sure she'll survive it. <laughs> <laughs> and spoilers. Oh, and so, uh, and so, we're getting to our the final stretch of it. Yeah, we are, we're already getting into the the kind of final half hour. We told <laughs> you this already movie getting went into. swiftly. <laughs> <laughs> we've been talking for two hours. <laughs> well, we're already there. <laughs> <laughs> we've all been talking for quite two hours yet. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, let, let, let's, uh, let's let's move on to this finale that we've got to so quickly. Um, let's get into it. Yeah, depending on your point of view. <laughs> Ah, so we we're we're cutting to a train. Um, that's where the finale happens on a train um, on the the TVG, and uh, apparently, the, the, it's really interesting how this like this train sequence is like set up because it's like a mixture of like models and live action and CGI. Um, so they had like a couple of you know when um, Jim and and Ethan you know towards the end of the sequence or like on the top of the trains and stuff like that that's like um kind of scale size models uh, made in pinewood studios and they've got like a big wind machine that, that you know produced winds of uh 140 miles an hour which means they had to be really careful on set because even the smallest object could basically turn into a bullet um so like these films have always been dangerous they've just got progressively more dangerous right um and um they couldn't fit the the kind of live action sequences the exteriors uh the apparently the, the french railways w- wouldn't allow them uh, to film on on the French railways, uh, so they're actually being filmed up here in Scotland, um, and they, like it was on the the Glasgow South West Line. So that's interesting a bit of trivia, a bit for you. <laughs> uh, interesting historical trivia. Uh, were this accurate at the time? Uh, the British side of this of this train trip was not high speed because they had not actually the rail that they put down couldn't take it so the french rail on the french side the rail was uh was stable and they had done what they needed to do so it was a high speed train after the tunnel but not before uh in this direction not on the british side oh just to well actually this you know otherwise rich in verisimilitude film <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, that's, I, oh, that's that's an interesting tip right there I, I i didn't know that but i mean it does seem uh, uh, anybody who's experienced rail travel in the uk uh, will not be surprised uh <laughs> yeah i think i get to uh take that train this november so here's hoping oh that particular train that goes through the channel Tunnel. yeah or? i uh the current plan is to go over to London for like two weeks at the end of November. And then for my birthday, I take a couple of days and go over to Paris. Oh, uh, cause awesome. I've never been. Oh. So, yeah. Oh, <laughs> and that's uh, Adam's personal corner for this episode. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Well, we've had a lot of time in Tangent Corner, and, and oh, we really have. Yeah. We should really, you know, we should really yeah, do, no, this, do something with this space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, people, I mean, uh, people are maybe used to the show now um, being yeah. being somewhat tangential. Um, anyway, uh, we will uh, get on with the plot. I mean, if Abe Goldfarb had joined us on this episode, it would be a limited series. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, this, this, the, uh, this, this, this podcast has never experienced the joys of, of Abe Goldfarb. You, you would have to search out oh, my, right. my other podcast, the, the, the Guilty Pleasure podcast, uh, for for that. But no, there'd be, you know, there would have been like a song and dance number in the middle. Like, <laughs> you know, it's it, there, yes. it's. It's a it's a whole experience, a great experience. But um, yes. yes, we do need to get back to the plot. I'm, I'm going to get back to the plot right now. That's what that's what I'm going to do. There's a lot of things happening on this stream. Erstwhile um, in Mission Impossible. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, what's happening on this stream? Many things. Everybody's on this stream. All the characters have come together. Everybody's here for this party. Kidridge is here. He gets his train tickets on arrival because, like, um, Ethan wants to know, it wants him to know that he's in London and he gets some train tickets so he knows where to go. Um, obviously, Ethan's on the train. Luther's on the train trying to block the signal to put that a list out into the public that Max and her henchmen are trying to do. And um, yes, and then also like obviously uh, Jim's on the train, Claire's on the train, and we're all we're kind of cutting back and forth between uh, various various parties doing various things. Also, the one of the little moments that I really enjoy in this scene is when uh, Luther like puts his phone. Uh, in a way to try and keep jamming the signal, even though he, he kind of knows that um, he has to get up from his seat, you know, because then uh, people might get suspicious. And then one walks away, and the the one of the, the train people uh, gives him his phone back. The henchman, there's a henchman that gets really suspicious of him, the kind of secondary henchman, and uh, just it's just like. A, I don't know. It's just a little fun note in this scene because it just kind of the, the henchman is just kind of driven mad by it. And uh, when Kittredge is like walking through the, the train, the henchman is just trying to batter the toilet door down to get to Luther because he might be somebody who is suspicious. <laughs> like I don't. It's just yes. funny. <laughs> yeah. And Luther gets very, really upset too. You can tell when the guy, the, the what bus boy or whatever it is. The waiter hands him it, and he's so polite about it. And Luther is just like, "Oh, yeah, yeah thanks." <laughs> oh, uh, and like uh, also, we should mention that Luther uh, is doing his hacking on an apple because, much like the Bond movies, these films have corporate sponsorships that they've got to <laughs> <laughs> they've got to promote. <laughs> Costs a lot of money to blow up an aquarium. Yeah. <laughs> what, so what are you flying Austin. on? Is it British Airways? Are we all yeah. sponsored by British Airways? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Have we said British <laughs> Airways enough uh, so far in the movie? Oh, okay. Is that satisfied that contract? Okay, cool. Yeah. So we had, so we get to see Jim. I, I don't know if I should add a wink, wink. Um, <laughs> yeah. We see Jim walking around a lot to the point that Claire starts to follow him into the back, and kind of get to the back to booth area where there's all the luggage and everything and he, Jim's just sitting there and Claire obviously, just the most trusting spot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just reveals everything. It's not yeah, she doesn't even like try and be sneaky about it. <laughs> she just puts it all out there for Jim. Why are you saying it like that, Craig? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we get the first of what would become kind of the what the signature mask reveal. In, in kind of these movies where it isn't Jim, it is Ethan Hunt. And dun, dun, dun. Again, as we've mentioned earlier on in the podcast, um, Tom Cruise has, has taken on, on the height and dimensions <laughs> of John Voight uh, by putting on a mask. Because <laughs> magic exists in this yeah. universe, as Adam established. But he didn't have, they don't have the voice recorders yet, or the voice um authenticators or whatever they call them. Um, right. So he couldn't do any talking. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, 
Jim is just there. Yeah. Like, I don't really get that. He's just, like, hanging out in the thing. Like, because that doesn't seem to be a hallway to anything. So it's like, was he just standing there watching? Like, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's That was one thing where it's like, I really don't understand the psychology of this moment. Yeah. But okay. <laughs> yeah. And it's basically, yeah, it's revealed Jim even knows that because what Claire asked why he did it and because Ethan knew that Jim was the mole, but he didn't know if Claire was involved. So that was his way of figuring out whether or not she was in on it as well. Yeah. And there's there's a, a note that I wanted to make here as well, where the like he's talking about that and he's saying that um, Claire wasn't convinced that Ethan w- would fall for it, um, fall for her, which... You know, like, um, in terms of what the movie is showing uh, us, uh, we're not really convinced either because of the complete lack of sensual chemistry. <laughs> but, then, <laughs> but then he also says he was convinced because he had already uh, tested the goods, which I was just like, oh, gross. <laughs> Imagine describing your wife they, in those yeah. terms. Oh. <laughs> and they, yeah, he brings up the Bible verse, too, to link it back to the whole Bible thing of... Don't cover your or cover covet your. Thou shall not cover yeah. their neighbor's wife. Hey, would you guys mind if we pause for a second? Yep. I need to run to the bathroom. Thanks. So yeah, then so after he kind of talks about his wife that way, Jim then shoots Claire, and then escapes up to the hatch while Ethan is holding Claire because even though she betrayed him as well, he still feels that kind of compassion for her, and then he ends up chasing after Jim, and we they're on this you know the speeding train and the helicopter we get to see that Krieger is in the helicopter coming up behind the train and during this whole sequence well we don't really have any more there's not really any more cutbacks as much as there was prior no yeah no it really just watching the trees on this now i like in in the trains when it train scene started you know, we're cutting between Maxine and her aide and um, uh, Kidridge and his guys and Luther and, and, you know, all these kind of different points of view. But, like, we kind of stick with Ethan mainly um, after they go out onto the top of the tree. Yeah. And what's interesting, is, too, is it's one of those, I don't know, in the same way what, in seasons prior where you see, like, uh, I guess it makes more sense, but when you saw Sylvester Stallone facing... Um, I can't think of his name right now. In um, Cliffhanger. Based John on Lithgow. Movie. Yeah, John Lithgow. And you're like, eh, I don't know if that's an even match. But it seems like it is. <laughs> that that was kind of how I felt at points of Ethan facing Jim. Like, man, Jim is like holding his own really well. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's true. I, I think like um, it, the scene in Cliffhanger kind of works because... It, because he's been going through so much already, you know. Yeah, because he's going, he, he's going through through so much already, and also because uh, John Lithgow's quite tall, and they put him in like a big jacket, like he re- looks real bulky. Um, and yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and and also because uh, Sly is only like not much taller than me. I'm like five eight. I think he's like five nine, yeah. and like. I think John Lithgow's like a legit like six four or something. So like you, they really make a, a big thing of like the height difference as well in, in that movie that kind of that kind of pays off. Yeah, no, that make yeah, it makes sense. But with this one, <laughs> um... again, I suppose John Voight is a bigger like Ethan yeah, he is it's like a big age difference. So you kind yeah. of like well, you know, Ethan Hunt has this because like he's much younger, but like. I, again, he is a bigger guy. Uh, like, but again, you know, and I, I Voight has like, or uh, Jim Phelps has like planned for this. He has yeah. those little magnetic things where he can like yeah. hold on to yeah, and move. True. He's got yeah. the ropes and everything. Uh, you know, Ethan's just clinging on by literally by the you know his, his fingertips. Yeah, <laughs> that's. But uh, on the flip side of that, because you know that Ethan Hunt's super. Even in this movie, you kind of know Ethan Hunt's superhuman. That like uh, you just never quite believe that <laughs> that he's going to like he's going to do anything like he's always going to win. Is it? I mean, it's not quite. I'll make another example that is probably even more ridiculous. It's a bit like 
there's a final confrontation in Under Siege 2 where Steven Seagal is facing down Eric Bogusian, and you're like, well, what's Eric Bogusian going to do? <laughs> <laughs> This is where you just invert the Indiana Jones thing and shoot him. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's what Eric Bogusian's going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Should have done that. Uh, but the, again, it's a Steven line, Seagal uh, movie, so uh, even that probably wouldn't have, like... It's, I've, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's the bit in Harold and Kumar go to White Castle where, like, the cop gets shot, and he's like, bullets! My only weakness! <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, to, to be fair, I, I mean, like, uh, bullets are, are not Steven Seagal's weakness because in the finale of Out for Justice, he, he gets shot by a fucking shotgun and still manages to decimate William Forsyth. So, um, yeah. that you know, I don't know what his weakness is. Steven Maybe a Seagal nuke. Eat, Steven Seagal <laughs> eats bullets for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> his only weakness is his own ego. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too true. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Fair point, Craig. Back with the clock continuity. <laughs> so we're on the top uh, of a train. Krieger is trying to get close enough so that Jim can kind of jump on and they can take off. And then yeah, Ethan is basically he's holding on for dear life and he's trying to fight with them while he's fighting the helicopter that Krieger is smashing into him or trying to slice him with and then trying to make sure they don't leave by either latching the helicopter things like that but the tunnel comes up and since Krieger is latched at the point then he's unable to fly above the I guess above the tunnel and he has to fly within the tunnel in itself. One thing I, I kind of love about like these films and I'd forgotten about the, but like, so the very beginning, they have the scene with the guy, they give him the drink, he dies, and then they break the walls down and it's a set. And that's, of course, you know, they revisit that in Fallout. Um, yeah. You know, this, like, I remember Mission Impossible 3 with the whole bridge sequence. Later on, like, the news is on and it's like, oh, yeah, they're talking about it. And it's like, I had forgotten that that's very present here. Like, T- TV news is a huge character and they do they report on like yeah a helicopter flew into a tunnel it was crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah I because love like these little beats yeah no it's, uh, absolutely because like like you say like sky news uh turns up um a couple of times um you know because like in in the uk um in in the movie and one of the i i didn't mention this when when it came up but i'll I'll mention it now because i've just remembered that i was like oh uh krieger uh really mingling you know uh make you know going native and and uh you know uh, doing doing what they do in uh london because like uh, in the scene when they're at the like the hideout like when uh you know uh, Ethan is like checking the disc like before he Krieger comes out with the disc uh Krieger is drinking a beer uh watching the football results hmm. and I, I was just yeah. like no oh, that's good <laughs> <laughs> yes um, <laughs> yeah there are these little beats of like this is recognizable life yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. Also, I wanted to mention, right? And again, this this might this might mean something to you, Craig, because I, I know you've seen the day today. But I remember yeah. when I seen this. Um, David Schneider is a an actor in various British comedies, and I'd seen him. And it's always weird when you see like a TV actor in like a big movie, particularly a British yeah. TV actor. And he appeared in various sketch shows and various things. Yeah. And even as a kid for seeing this, I was like, holy shit, that's David, David Schneider. And it like, he <laughs> plays the train engineer who is like being like, there's a helicopter on the back. You got of what is going on? <laughs> you know, like, um, and then uh, yeah, later on in, in the scene where, you know, the, the he helicopter <laughs> blades like stop just uh, at uh, Ethan's son, just before decapitating him. Uh, like he, he faints and like it yeah. always stood out in my head and i think don't, it's maybe just because... don't slow down it'll hit us speed up yeah yeah <laughs> i think it's a great little cameo i i yeah. you know it's one of the scenes that always stuck out to me yeah no i remember <laughs> i forgot about him like oh 
He's just there kind of adding some lightness to everything that's happening right now. Uh, it should have been his POV, or we should just see it all from his perspective. <laughs> be amazing. Yeah. I just you it's know, like I'm the just... uh, the grave digger joke. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear, but uh, yeah, but the, yeah, the gum comes up again, and that's what the they... gum does come up because he gave him the pack. Yeah. Um, so yeah. so he jumps onto the helicopter. The theme tune kicks in again, so you know shit's kicking off. I uh, and then um he yeah he puts the he puts the, the, the gum on the, the front of the helicopter and again it's not as iconic as the Langley scene but like another one of the kind of iconic moments in this movie is when he jumps from the helicopter onto the train, the helicopter explodes and yeah, and then the the propellers continually slow down and you're like oh it really adds up to the tension of well, like yeah. you know deep in your heart you know that Ethan Hunt's not going to be decapitated but still right. it's a yeah. tense uh, you know really exciting moment and yeah. in case you're worried that or thinking that maybe John Boyd and Jim will come back no it shows that fiery <laughs> helicopter land on top of him and <laughs> he is very dead yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, John Voight is never coming back. <laughs> Mission, Mission Impossible does a great job, the whole franchise, of making sure that vill- the villains they want dead stay dead. Yes, this is not the Fast and the Furious. Um, you know, <laughs> villains don't like come back from the dead and become a good guy. That's this is not that franchise. <laughs> McCoy actually talks about like uh, Sean Harris, who plays the the villain in Rogue Nation and Fallout. Um, like he agreed to Rogue Nation w- with like the contingent of like, but I have to die. Like you, oh. ha- you have to kill my character. I don't want to come back. And Macquarie said he's like, I don't think you know how Hollywood works. Like <laughs> I can kill you, but if this movie's a hit, you got a twin you don't know about or <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. something <laughs> like. Like yeah, it's it's cynical, but you know, but yeah, back then, you know, I mean, th- even if this was a franchise, like. The only person you knew was sticking around was Tom Cruise. Yeah. yeah. You know, so you could, like, actually kill characters. Yeah. Yeah. I th- miss those days. I think it would <laughs> definitely be harder, as, I mean, you were talking about, to Adam killing people off now, like Benji or any of them. But, yeah, I, I think about that every time a new Mission Impossible movie comes out. Because of this first one, you know, got rid of the team. I'm like, yeah. like, I, want, I wonder if they're going to take out any of them now i don't know it is interesting because like you do feel it's like you have like a kind of core you have a core that you can't get rid of now like most yeah. up until up until recently you felt like most of the characters in mission impossible Bones are relatively disposable apart from ethan Hunt, but and and, and luther who's, who's been a, a constant right um but now you've got you've got as well as luther you've got benji who's first introduced in three and you know like, like you say like ferguson's character you know yeah. you, you've got these kind of core characters now that you think like oh you can't really get rid of them like it'd be but sad. it's interesting it'd be really because sad. of this precedent like at the beginning of fallout when they kind of threatened to kill luther it's like i mean i guess they could <laughs> you know like yeah. Yeah. you know and that would be emotionally resonant and everything like i'm glad they didn't obviously i, I love that character and it, he has so many great moments in that movie um but like and the whole point of it being like he ethan can't let go you know, mm-hmm. he can't, let, you know, yeah, it, yeah, that's, that it really has continued on through the series. So, well, I suppose Anywho. we should quickly wrap this yes. one up, um, you know, because we're so good at doing things quickly, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> like, uh, you know, we've just got like a couple of scenes uh, yeah. right at the end of the movie, just to tie everything up in a nice little bow. Um, the plot has finished, uh, but uh, we get Ethan and Luther uh, sharing a pint in good old London town. We and, find out uh, that e- Ethan's parents are okay. Yes, yep. they're, they're they're okay. They were uh, we didn't really <laughs> mention confused. that they were kind of framed <laughs> on drug charges by Kitteridge, uh, but yeah. they have been uh, totally exonerated, uh, much to Ethan's mum's uh, relief. Um, and Luther is now no longer disavowed. Um, he is avowed. Um, <laughs> Re- reavowed, yeah. <laughs> uh, reavowed, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, like that kind of wrap, that kind of wraps that up. Uh, and then we've got instead of Voight on a plane, uh, we've got Cruz on a plane, 
uh, calling calling back to that earlier scene, and we do a kind of mirror scene where Cruz turns down the film, but uh, the ear stewardess says, "Are you interested in Caribbean cinema?" And uh, Ethan Hunt. Uh, pricks up his ears and is like, hmm, this could be a mission. And then we cut to Daniel that Finn's theme, though. Of the yeah. theme <laughs> and that's the end. We did Yay! Yeah. <laughs> we did we it. Across the finish line. <laughs> oh, so I'm, I'm happy with it. Yeah. You guys yeah. happy with it? Yeah. <laughs> I, am, I am happy with it, too. Yeah. We're, I we're got to spend agreed. a couple hours talking about Mission Impossible with you guys. This was a delightful Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> We need to have you on to do a special the entire Mission Impossible. We, I mean, like oh, podcast uh, that would only be like if if enough people listen to this episode and then review the episode, then we can set up a Patreon because technically we cannot review any more of the Mission yes. Impossible movies because they're not nineties movies. But if we have a Patreon, you can pay us to. Talk about whatever movie, action movie <laughs> you, you want from any dear, era. So you, we will talk about the whole franchise. For dear hours. listeners, you have the power to make my life not have been spent in vain. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have we barely touched on Ghost Protocol. <laughs> that, that yeah. is true. But, oh. I mean, like... Um... There's a really good video on YouTube, or there's two. Um, Mikey Newman and Patrick Willems both did videos about the Mission Impossible franchise, mm. and uh, they're really wonderful if if you check them out, like to to watch in in conjunction with each other. Um, yeah, I, I'm a fan. <laughs> and um, as we're kind of shouting out like uh, Mission Impossible things. Um, I read various things uh, about the the making of Mission Impossible uh, from from various sources, including an article I read in the, the uh, a Prague newspaper, uh, which told you about the, some of the locations that were filmed at and how the U.S. Embassy was actually a mixture of the the Liechtenstein Palace for the exterior and the National Museum for oh. the interior, because um, oh. the U.S. Embassy is apparently less glamorous and than uh, what is seen on screen. Uh, so, like, various sources, but one of those sources uh, was the, the Light the Fuse podcast, which is a podcast totally dedicated yeah. to the Mission Impossible franchise, and I, I got some cool little tidbits from that, so if people want more Mission Impossible in their lives, um, they can check that podcast out as well. The 100th episode of that's so much fun, because Macquarie's on there the entire time, and they get, like, Simon Pegg and I think Haley Atwell, and it's just... Yeah, that that's a really fun podcast. I've yeah. listened to a fair bit of that. Yeah. And also, um, listener, if you think this episode is ridiculous, um, just wait <laughs> until you check out the Empire Film Podcast interviews with Christopher <laughs> McQuarrie. Oh, boy. <laughs> it, what was it, five hours? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, it's five hours all told for just yeah. for Fallout? Yeah. Yeah, just Fallout. Yeah, just Fallout. It's, it's two part. I think it's five hours all told, yeah. Honestly, like he is a great rock on tour. Um, I think you can still find it online. Uh, Jeff Gold, the Q and A with Jeff Goldsmith. Uh, the, he has an episode back when we were creative screenwriting podcast uh, of Chris McQuarrie Q and A screening after Valkyrie, um, and he just it's it's he's such a great storyteller, and he really will get into like behind the scenes stuff. And he has no problem talking about, like, you know, especially if something works out well. He talks about, like, he didn't want Benicio Del Toro to play Fenster and Usual Suspects, uh, you know, and kind of how that came to be. And it's, yeah, any, if, if you are, if you're interested in filmmaking and especially like contemporary blockbuster, you know, stuff like he is such a fascinating uh, uh storyteller about that stuff and he has a it's very much from the inside because of his work with tom cruise and what and and whatnot yeah i i highly recommend just listening to christopher mccrory talk about film it's great well we will now uh officially bring this one to book but before we head on out um do you have any plugs promos anything you want to shout out and i just want to to give you a note here that um we might be filming in, in august but this this episode will go out uh, around christmas time um so um keep that in mind craig you got anything oh um 
Or, just my. Or, oh, was it supposed to be me? Okay. Yeah, yeah you know, I was handing to you first. Uh, gotcha. Usually. Gotcha. Um, I actually don't. I just wanted to come on and talk about Mission Impossible. Um, you know, a, a Ghost Waits is out. You can get it on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Um, arrow player.com, obviously, uh, still a, a wonderful service. The Blu ray is available. Um, McLeod, uh, his new movie. Uh, when I consume you with Perry Blackshear, Evan Dumichel, and Libby Ewing just had its premiere. Uh, by I don't know, they haven't said yet uh, what the distribution side of that thing is, but keep an eye out for when I consume you. Uh, McLeod doing stellar work as always, um, and yeah, I mean, really, like I just I just wanted to come on and talk about this movie. I love these movies, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, and uh, Craig, give us your usual plugs and social media details. Yeah. Yes, uh, as Josh already said, I am one third of the Bloodhound Picks PIX podcast, uh, where we talk about obs- older, obscure, and entirely independent, usually horror movies. And we'll highlight them. We'll also kind of highlight members of the independent horror community, be it bloggers, filmmakers, screenwriters, actors, um, scholars and so on and kind of talking about what is it like trying to work in this genre in modern day, especially during this pandemic. Um, then if you want to follow me personally, you can at Craig dot dram D R A H E I M on Instagram or just Craig dram on Twitter. And then bloodhound picks is on um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and there's the website bloodhoundpicks.com and if you want to listen to any more of me uh, you can on my podcast New Horror Express um, which you can find um, at the website newhorrorexpress.com but also on Facebook and Twitter Twitter at New Horror EXP um, basically I interview uh, people from the world of horror but also uh, I have a monthly special where I look at a guilty pleasure movie from uh, to, from, you know, from one of the films from the 2000s horror films from the 2000s onwards um, we kind of do that uh, monthly and um, yeah you can also hit me up on, on Twitter if you want um, at scottmurphy85 you can hit this show up at Twitter at 90s underscore all and um, if you've enjoyed this um, all, all of this, all of which we've given you, all the tangents and all that. Um, if you're really digging it, uh, you can leave us a review uh, wherever you listen to a podcast. And if you can make those reviews five stars, that would be absolutely amazing because we live in a world where if you don't give things five stars, people think they're shit. I don't know why that is, but that is just, we have to accept it. And yeah, <laughs> uh, that's that's all for this time. That brings this uh, season to a close, and uh, hopefully we'll come back uh, for season five in the new year. Uh, more of which details coming later. But until then, see ya. <laughs>